Texas. Handing over to you. Kia ora, Angie. Kia ora, Tefano. Thank you, Angie. Shout out to the Leanza office crew and Leanza Council for their support with today's Climate Action webinar. Um, uh, the title of today is Librarians and Emergency Management, Cyclone Gabriel and Hastings District Libraries. So, uh, yeah, ahi ahi marie, ko Alexis McCullough toko ingoa, uh, kei ngā pātaka kōrero o Tamaki Makoto, aho e mahi ana. Kia ora, I'm Alexis McCullough. Um, I work at Auckland Libraries in the beautiful Tamaki Makoto. Weather's really putting it on for us this, today. Um, I'm the chair of the Leanza Standing Committee on Climate Action. And on the call today, we also have Jane Clark, who's our deputy chair of our committee. So with the increasing numbers of climate-related severe weather events across Aotearoa and the world, the role of librarians in disaster planning and emergency management has become more crucial than ever. We're really grateful today to be joined by Kristen Clothier, Learning and Discovery Team Leader of Hastings District Libraries. Kristen is going to share the experiences of Hastings District Library staff taking part in the emergency response in the aftermath of Cyclone Gabrielle and in the recovery effort in the days, weeks and months that followed. Uh, we really want to mihi to Kristen for her openness to share these experiences with Leanza members, with everyone on the call today, colleagues across our sector, and anyone else interested in the essential role that librarians are playing and will continue to play as part of emergency response and recovery from climate-related significant weather events and disasters. So just a reminder, as Angie has, has front-footed, that today's session is being recorded and will be available online after the session. So a little bit about how today will run. Uh, Kristen will be presenting to us for the first half of the session with an opportunity for uh, Q&A afterwards. I'm going to hand over to my fellow committee member, Jane, to introduce herself and run through how people on the call today can um, put those questions to Kristen. Uh, so I'll hand over to you, Jane. Kia ora. Uh, kia ora koutou. Uh, ko Jane Clark, toku ingoa. Um, I work at Massey University um, at our Aotearoa campus uh, in Tamaki Makoto, Auckland. Um, for the Q&As Q um, after the presentation, we're going to use a tool called Slido. Um, it is a tool where you can post a question anonymously or with your name as you prefer um, that you would like us to ask Kristen after her presentation. Um, other audience members can then also upvote other people's questions in this tool um, that you like. Uh, so in a moment, I'm going to post a link to our Slido in the chat, um, and you can open it in another tab or a second monitor, uh, whichever you um, are using. Uh, you can type in a question at any point. Um, feel free to also use the <laughs> sorry. Feel free to also use the chat if you just want to comment on something. Um, yep. So back to Alexis. Kia ora. thanks for that Jane, excited to use Slido today, really um, looking forward to your questions and I know Kristen is too, um, so yeah do pop your questions in there and do jump in and vote um, for a question if it's something that resonates with you and that you'd like to hear about as well. Um, so just before I hand over to Kristen, I'd just like to take a moment together to acknowledge the people whose lives were deeply affected by Cyclone Gabrielle, including the people who lost their lives and their whanau who faced such an unfathomable loss. Um, I'd also like to th acknowledge the strength of the communities of Heratonga Hastings, Te Mātoua Maui, Hawke's Bay, and the West Auckland communities of Piha, Karikari, Waimauku, and Murawai, and many other areas across Aotearoa where communities were impacted heavily um, by Cyclone Gabriel. So yeah, um, in, in that spirit, um, just holding those communities close to us and remembering what's what has happened, um, just wanted to also, yeah, now um, acknowledge Kristen and the, and the librarians of Hastings District Libraries and the, and the mahi that they did. Um, so thank you again, Kristen. Thank you for coming today to share in with us. And um, I will hand over to you. So kia ora, welcome. Kia ora, All thank yours. you very much. <laughs> I'm just going to share the presentation and just give me one moment. Just loading up. Perfect. Can everyone? I mean, I can't see anyone else, but can everyone see this? Perfect. I've got some thumbs up there. Um, perfect. Hiratonga uh, Hokinui, Hiratonga Araro, 
Hiratonga, Haro Otikahu, Hiratonga, Rau Rau Homako, Hiratonga, Rengahora, Hiratonga, Takotonoa, Tihei Hiratonga. Akiora ko Kristen Takuunga. For those of you that don't know me, I am Kristen Clothier, um, Learning and Discovery Team Leader for Hastings District Libraries. Today I'm going to be talking to you about the role that um, Hastings District Libraries and our staff played during the emergency response and recovery for Cyclone Gabriel. Um, I'd like to preface this presentation by explaining that this might not and probably will not be um, the experience of every library or librarian um, in their experience working in emergency management. This presentation just covers a small part of our story. Um, and before I get into it, I would also like to note a tri trigger warning. There are some distressing images and content in this presentation. Can you start that again, Kirsten? I can't see anything. I'm not sure if anyone else can. The video isn't playing. Okay. Let's have a look. Can anyone see the video? No? Okay. It no, it isn't our, coming through. It worked in our tests. Let's have a look. It's working. Here we go. So that there's just a brief overview of the cyclone. Um, this image here shows the district of Hiratonga Hastings. It's very, very large. It spans um, over 5,200 square kilometres and the population is almost 92,000 people. Around um, just over 51,000 live in the Hastings urban area 15,000 in Havelock North and 25,000 in rural areas and settlements. Uh, the magnitude of the square metres that needed to be covered, um, the terrain and the fact that Napier and uh, the Napier district was totally cut off from the Hastings district. So I'm just going to see if this comes up here, but this little area in here is the Napier district and there was no way to get from Napier to Hastings. Um, the lack of power and communications made the emergency response very, very challenging. Uh, the Mayor declared a local state of emergency in the early hours of Tuesday the 14th of February 2023, and this was followed up with a region-wide declaration. 
Uh, these declarations were later superseded by the minister declaring a state of national emergency. Um, the Hastings District Council CE had instructed that an EOC, sorry, there's lots of um, abbreviations here, so EAC is an emergency operations centre, um, and an IMT, which is an incident management team, be established within council on the afternoon of Sunday, the 12th of February. So the EOC is led by a local controller who manages the council response under the direction of CEDM, Civil Defence Emergency Management Group Controller. Um, the council's EOC ran 24 hours per day, seven days a week, until Sunday the 19th of February. The EOC ran under weekly operation orders, which set objectives and taskings for the week. The controllers ran the EOC according to the SIM structure, which you can see here. The purpose of the SIMS structure is to enable staff to respond effectively to incidents through the appropriate coordination across functions and organisations. It helps establish a common structure, functions and terminology in a framework that is flexible, modular and scalable, and the framework can be tailored for specific circumstances. Uh, this allows controllers to engage and integrate within um, other groups and civil defence. Um, other local councils and emergency services as there's a common commonality operating platform um, and the sharing of intelligence. So the EOC for council was stood down on Wednesday the 22nd of March and staff assisting with the response went back to their business as usual roles. At that time the transition team was stood up to deal with the remaining logistics and supply requests to isolated rural communities and then this work was integrated into the Community Wellbeing and Services Group, Business as Usual, um, in mid-June. So this next slide here is just a couple of images of that were taken around the district. So the bottom left um, image shows just how high the silt uh, was in many places. So they've had to dig their car out um, and it was like that all through the house as well. Uh, this here is a picture of a small number of library staff that were involved in the response. So the Hastings District Council employs approximately 470 permanent full-time and part-time staff members and about 180 council staff worked on the cyclone response. Hastings District Libraries have three sites and we have about 40 permanent full-time and part-time staff. Um, during the response, we had 23 library staff working um, emergency management um, and it was very hard. We could not get all 23 staff together for a photo shoot. So library staff are often asked to help during emergency management and I think when you work in libraries, you know why we get asked. Um, but I asked the council's emergency readiness and business continuity advisor uh, why library staff and her response was, well, you know how to treat people. Um, she also said some lovely things about why it's very important to get libraries open as soon as possible, being such a valuable community resource. But the line, you know how to treat people really stuck with me. I mean, our core role is working with the public on a daily basis. We are boots on the ground for council. We're working with our community on a variety of um, things, some of it very sensitive and in a variety of situations. And because of that, we become trusted faces in our community. Um, and to reflect that during the work and the response, so many of us started conversations with, hi, I'm blank and in normal life, I work in libraries. Um, this here is um, a bit of an updated arm of the SIM structure. So during the response, we had a handful of staff working in other functions um, in SIMS, so PIMS for public information, operation and logistics, but the majority of our library staff were allocated to the welfare space. So this image here shows an updated welfare arm, which um, council created based on the needs we saw come out of Cyclone Gabriel and feedback that was given by staff involved. 
Um, so while this arm does look different than it did in the cyclone, this makes it a whole lot easier to see where we had staff allocated during the response. So we had staff who were welfare managers, who were 2IC, we had staff in the admin and inbox, we had staff completing welfare um, needs assessments, we had boots on the ground, um, we had staff helping in our civil defence centres and then in our community hubs. So that's pretty much every circle in that image. Uh, Veronica, who's our local history librarian, wore many hats during the response. She really shone. She was on admin and during that time she received a very worried email. Sorry. Just, just take your time, Kristen. Like we've had some discussions in the lead up just about, um, again, how, what a significant time this was for for all of the the team involved, and and so yeah, just do take your time if you need it because it's it's not it's not easy stuff, um, and we're think, we're all with you. I didn't think this would be the bit that got me. <laughs> so she got a very worried email from an overseas family member who hadn't heard from their relative. Um, it turns out that he was a library regular and she could let um, them know that she had seen him since the event. Um, she was out and about on one of the first days, in fact, the first day, helping the intelligence team to know what was going on around the place. And during that, for many of our communities, she was the very first face they saw. Um, she told me about pulling up to a house um, and talking to the wife, who was very upset and recounting what they'd been through time and time again, and they both had lots of tears shed. Um, and while this was going on, her husband was wading in chest deep water trying to save their livestock. Um, she attended community meetings. She reveled in wearing her high-vis welfare civil defence vest. Um, she's amazing at taking charge, and she was also boots on the ground, um, attending homes with our building assessors, doing welfare needs assessments while they were assessing the buildings. Um, she was very upset to return that vest uh, back to the team at the end. Uh, Kate, who is now our manager, but during the time of the response, she uh, was in my role as learning and discovery team leader. She was uh, on the ground in the IMT right from the get go. Uh, lucky her, she lives a few blocks from council and was one of the few that had access to the building without road closures. Um, she told me about her very first harrowing shift where she was the only person in welfare in the building and for 12 hours she manned the inbox and moved all the messages about X number of people stuck in X location in need of rescuing and supplies into a folder so that someone else in another part of the building could map, out, um, map all of these out and pass on the information to the helicopter and rescue teams. She said that what struck her the most from this time was the knowledge that she needed to have trust in the process and that trust in another person to pick that up and make sure those people were okay. And there was nothing more she could do than move those emails. Um, things changed so rapidly during this time. After a few days of myself being an IMT, I said to her that I felt like each day was totally different. One day you feel like you're onto it, you're doing a great job, you know exactly what's happening. It's like you're working on a puzzle and all the pieces are, are falling into place and making sense. And then you show up the next day and everyone or someone says to you, psych, we're actually playing Scrabble and you have to relearn all the rules and how things work. But that's just the nature of the beast during an event of this magnitude. Um, a couple of weeks in, I was tasked with helping set up a community hub in Pukitapu. Uh, so Pukitapu is a rural settlement and it was divided in two when the bridge that runs between them was completely wiped out. Um, on my first day there, I spoke to a mum who lived rurally to the rural community and normally it took her 20 minutes to do a school run. So she'd drop her kids off at school at Pukitapu Primary School. She'd go to Napier, drop her kids off at high school and then she'd go to work. Um, and she had just quit her job because with the bridge gone between her and the school, 
it took her three hours each way to take her kids to school. Um, during this time, every single day, you heard such horrible things about what people had gone through. But for the most part, everyone was really upbeat and happy to see you and get the help that they needed or could get. Um, and there was a really strong community spirit. When you have been dealing with these really intense, horrible things and you're hearing these horrible situations that people are in, um, it's quite jarring where you then pick up a phone call or receive an email from someone complaining that their recycling hasn't been picked up and wondering if they could get a rates rebate. So it really put things into perspective for, for me. Um, here are a couple of more images. So uh, I believe that there's 13 bridges that need to be completely rebuilt in our district. And there's a couple of them there that don't look great. In the bottom right hand picture here is Hukururi Girls College. So this college is a boarding school um, based in Eskdale and they evacuated their students the day before. And you can see where the silt has made it up to in their, around their school. So they haven't returned um, to the school um, for a short amount of time. They borrowed a couple of meeting rooms in one of our libraries to hold some classes, but they've since relocated to a new building in Havelock North, and there's a hotel that they're now using as their boarding house. Um, so there were many impacts to Hastings District Libraries in the weeks that followed the cyclone. Um, firstly, hours. So all council facilities, including libraries, closed effective immediately on the 14th of February. Um, Hastings Library opened with limited hours, which was 12 till 4 p.m., so four hours on Thursday, the 23rd of February. These limited hours reflected the lack of staff available. Um, and while we extended some hours at all sites, it wasn't until the 20th of March that we were in a position to safely open all three sites with our regular hours. And during this time, our regular programming was non-existent. Um, staffing. So as I said earlier, libraries have around 40 staff, um, a mixture of full and part-time, and we also have some casual staff members. 23 staff were involved during the response and many other staff members were unable to make it to Hastings safely. So Napier was completely blocked from Hastings for days. And when the roads opened, it was purely for emergency personnel. Um, and then once the road opened, it could take staff 90 minutes to two hours uh, to make a drive that would normally take 15 or 20 minutes. There was only one route open um, between the cities and everyone was trying to get through. And in Napier, there was no power for almost a week. Um, and that was for people that were located smack bang in the middle of urban areas. It was longer for those who were not. Um, and on top of this, we also have staff that live rurally behind bridges that were destroyed. Um, our Facebook page became an information feed, providing links and up-to-date information around facility closures, healthcare information for speakers about the languages, rubbish disposal, weather information, how to salvage Tonga, our library resources that can be used without being in the building, things like that. Um, and he, this is just a picture of some of the posts we had up during this time. So um, the council had two civil defence centres set up and one of them was in the Flaxmere Community Centre. And the Flaxmere Library is um, based at the community centre. So during this time, our library was used for a breakout space for families and those who needed a quiet private space amongst the madness. And we also had staff working in these CDCs. And then for um, a short space of time, very early on, the Hastings Library was used as a site where community connectors could meet with affected members of our community to see what support they could be linked in with, etc. This was very short lived. It became apparent early on that the library space didn't provide the privacy needed uh, while dealing with delicate issues with highly emotive people. So this next image here shows a setup in the Flaxmere Community Centre um, during the cyclone. Since the cyclone, the community centre is now equipped with supplies for 200 evacuees, and these supplies are all being housed on site. So that's um, fold-out beds, um, 
sleeping bags, hygiene kits, blankets. Uh, so there's also been a lot of work being done across the district housing resource to be used if areas are cut off, cut off or hubs need to be stood up. So a good example of this in action was in late June 2024, there was a weather event where we had to stand up an IMT in an evacuation centre opened at the Hamawana School Hall. So as part of this, council have a trailer which is um, set up and it came in with supplies for 40. Um, and I was out there, it was pouring with rain and we're busy getting the camping beds out for everyone. Um, and during this time, the Flaxmere Community Centre was also on call as an evacuation centre if more than 40 people needed to evacuate. Um, oh, sorry, I've just lost my little... Yeah, so we have a recollect site. We're very lucky to have a recollect site. And we have a Cyclone Gabriel collection on our Recollect site. This features digital images to links and links to articles from the aftermath of Cyclone Gabriel. So many of these images are from our staff members uh, that they took during their work on IMT or if they were personally impacted. Earlier this month, we launched a public plea to receive images from our community to help us preserve the story of Cyclone Gabrielle for future generations. At Hastings Libraries, we believe that sharing our stories is an essential part of healing and preserving our community's history. Photographs are a powerful tool that help us reflect on our experiences and ensure future generations understand the impact of Cyclone Gabrielle. By documenting this shared experience with empathy and care, we can provide a valuable record of our community's strength and perseverance. So we are encouraging people to uh, contribute their photos to be part of this important effort and we've already received some very moving images from our community um, and these will be added to our collection with the permission of those who have shared with us including the police so we've had some really um, amazing things passed over already in just the space of a couple of weeks. Um, a couple more images so this image on the left is a river crossing that was set up to get workers um, across the river. Um, my understanding is there's now a, a bridge, a, a semi-permanent bully bridge there. Um, so Pearl in a Whirl is a picture book written by local author Catherine Robertson and illustrated by Fifi Colston and published by Penguin Random House. This book came about in response to a series of tweets that Catherine saw um, from her friend Amy who lives in Pukitapu. So um, Amy's cat Pearl went missing and she tweeted the chronological adventure of Pearl. So Catherine thought this would make a really great picture book and in the third week of February the idea was conceived and Penguin Random House came to the party and it was launched shelf ready on the 13th of June 2023. So as part of this book launch, uh, the libraries, along with writers and schools, brought Fifi to Hastings and we were going to take Catherine and Fifi out to three local primary schools who were heavily impacted by the flooding. Um, but heartbreakingly, another severe weather event happened and there was surface flooding and it wasn't safe to travel. Uh, luckily, a month later, uh, we tried again and we travelled to Pakafai School, Twyford School and Pukitapu School where Catherine shared the story and Fifi shared the illustration journey and the kids shared their story. Almost every single child in each of those rooms had a, a story to share. Maybe they knew where the onions that flooded Pearl's house had come from, or they had a cat that they took to an evacuation centre and it ran away and it showed up at home. Um, and one of the teachers had her cat in the same category that became Pearl's home for a while. Our final school was Pukitapu School, and that was actually the school where Amy's children went. Since the cyclone, they had relocated, and so it was a bit of a homecoming for them. Um, and this was where I felt the most emotion. The whole family came to the session, and emotions were running really high. Um, Amy talked to the kids about how, yes, this was a story about her family, but it was everyone's story. They all had experienced it. Um, and there were many tears shed. 
what will stick with me was um, Pearl rides in a helicopter and Amy asked the kids uh, who had also gone in a helicopter and I had about 150 kids in front of me and over half of them had been evacuated by helicopter during the event. Um, Pearl in a Whirl was printed locally, bringing tens of thousands of dollars into the economy and all of Catherine's royalties and part of Fifi's royalties are being donated to the Hawke's Base um, Foundation Cyclone Relief Fund. Um, already thousands of dollars have been placed in that account. Um, so that was pretty special to be involved in. And I'm very familiar with this book because my toddler uh, makes me read it to her a couple of times a week as her bedtime story. And she thinks our cat is called Pearl. Um, sorry, I've just lost my place in my slides. Uh, these images here show Omahu, which is a small settlement which was inundated when the river burst its banks. Um, we actually have a staff member who lives out in Omahu and lost their home during the cyclone. The force of the water through Omahu was so strong that it ripped ancestors from the ground in the Urupa. The bottom right hand picture here is of Omahu school. Um, and so I saw that Sarah Neville um, has, is here today and um, our team's working very, very closely with her on the next part of this. So during the cyclone, the school was destroyed. Uh, the, oldie, the only building still standing is the original hall, which is a heritage building. Um, this was where much of the library collection was housed at the time, and the building was flooded with water that had passed through the Urupa. Um, while the building was salvaged and repaired due to its heritage status, heritage status the collection and wooden shelving were not able to be saved. Uh, so prior to the cyclone, we had been doing work with the community to install a little free library at the Marae. Um, after the event, Omahu School tasked Hastings Libraries with helping them rebuild their library space. Um, while this is not in the normal scope of work for the public library, due to the nature of the disaster and the overwhelming need for the community, um, HDL stepped, staff stepped up to manage the process um, with so much help from Sarah. The government provided $10 million, oh, sorry, $1 million for the School Library Collection Recovery Initiative, which was a collaboration between the Ministry of Education and National Library of New Zealand to support the recovery of school library services in affected regions. Izumahu was one of the most affected schools and an application was made on their behalf. The initiative provides replacement of school library collection items, related resources and library shelving to schools in Kura Kaupapa Māori where insurance is unable to fund a replacement in as new condition. So to date, we have found $85,000 worth of funding for their bills. That's shelving, thousands of shelf-ready titles from Wheelers and five years of Ixtisit um, library management system. On top of this, Funding has also been raised to enable the installation of a standalone building to be used as a dedicated library space. This building includes an accessibility ramp, aircon, vitex, wall lining, carpet delivery and consents, and this will be gifted to the school board. The process of, being, of getting consent from Ministry of Education to have a building on the school property that is owned by the board and not the minis ministry has been arduous but all the correct permissions are now in place. And this also means the building will be used as a library space in perpetuity. And MOE can't direct that it will be changed to a classroom. Honestly, the work done for this project is worthy of, of a webinar all of its own. So many hours of blood, sweat, and so, so many tears have gone into this project. And I am in awe of how the small team has made this come together. We cannot wait to complete this library space and pass on the precious taonga to the school. The current aim is for this to be in place for the second anniversary of Cyclone Gabriel. Uh, my final slide here shows a new training pathway. So Civil Defence Hawks, Hawks Bay have developed a new training pathway um, and it's being rolled out over the next few years. Council decided that they would offer this training to anyone who is employed by them who is interested. So, so far only the um, half day emergency management essentials training has been offered, but a large number of council staff have completed it. 
if you have completed the course, there's no expectation that you're going to be on a roster to be on a regular IMT, but they want as many staff to be empowered with the knowledge of what happens in an emergency. I completed the half day course earlier this year, and then I was working an IMT event three days later. I saw my tutor in the Civil Defence building and I told her it was a bit too soon for me. Um, once you've completed this course, you're encouraged to complete other courses as they become available. So they're developing courses for each arm of the SIM structure. So I know that I will end up in a welfare space during an emergency, so I'll be applying for every course that could give me more knowledge and understanding about how to help in upcoming events. Obviously, it's been a really rough time and not everything was done correctly. Hindsight is fantastic. Um, and of course, if you could redo things, you would and you could. Um, but all I can say is that every single person who was working there at any level put their all into it and was doing everything they could to do the right thing in the moment. And that's something that I'm really proud to have been part of. Thank you. Kia ora. Thank you so much, Kristen. Thank you for yeah detailing all of your experiences so thoroughly. Um, I think you know you've, you've there's a few questions that have popped up, some of which you've kind of addressed already, but would love to delve a little bit deeper into some of the aspects. So um, I will hand over to Jane to kind of take us through the Slido. But um, just wanted to sh say up here in Nga Pātaka Kōrero Tamaki Makoto, it's not working with my background, but you can see Pearl. Um, no, you can't. There she is. So um, if anybody wants to read Pearl in a Whirl, it's probably in your local public library. So all of Aotearoa has come to support with um, getting this beautiful story into libraries as well. So um, yeah, so I will hand over to um, Jane to, to give us an update on how the slide is going and what, what the, quest the burning questions at the top of the list. Thank you, Alexis. Um, and thank you, Kristen, for sharing um, your story with all of us. Um, yep, we've got some questions coming in, um, eight so far. Um, one of the top questions is, did the library staff who, who were involved in the Welfare Centre have prior training for these roles, prior to Cyclone Gabriel, I guess? Some yes, some no. Uh, before I was involved in this event, I didn't even know what a SIM structure was. Okay. Someone told me to talk to intelligence and I was like walking around like, is any, where's the intelligent people? I don't know where to go. Um, which I think is why I'm really keen to do as much training now as I can. I'm a person that really likes to uh, know exactly what I'm walking into, which in these situations is near impossible. Um, we weren't walking in blind though. We would have uh, meetings in the morning where we would talk about where people were going, what they could expect, what they needed to do their job. Um, and some people really uh, thrive in those environments. Um, Veronica, who I talked about earlier, uh, walked straight into a, a, meet, a community meeting and just off she went straight up to the front, ready to go. Um, not something that I can do, but yeah, we do have some staff who are on a regular roster for civil defence in IMT and they have had prior training, but um, majority of staff had not. And did they, sorry, I'm preempting some questions. Did they volunteer the ones that had not had prior training? So no one was forced to work IMT. One thing that came across really clear in conversations I've had with managers, but also when I had that conversation asking why library staff, um, it's really important that you know that your home and your family and your people are safe first. There's no way that you can walk into a situation and be a productive member of an emergency response team if you have no idea what's going on in your own at your own house. Um, and so that came first. Um, and then obviously people's personal circumstances. There was a few days before I jumped in because um, I think I was three weeks back from parental leave. So I had a, a a baby just in daycare and my partner is an electrician and so he was out digging silt out from under houses and helping reconnect power um, and so I had no one for childcare so there was 
there was no pressure to be there until I could be there. Okay. Um, but people very happily put their hand up very early on as well to be involved in all of those things. Um, I think as library staff, we we expect it. We know that we have those links with the community and that we have those skills and everyone who was involved did such a great job and no one was forced to do it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the next question that lots of people um, wanted asked, um, were there support systems in place to help staff with the mental health and emotional impact later on? Yes, absolutely. Um, we had, uh, obviously we are a member of EAP, so there's EAP, but they also brought in counsellors who were there that we could speak to at any time, we could make appointments, um, health and safety would find someone for us if we needed to speak to someone. They went through and talked to everyone involved. We also had um, access to some quick 10 minute massages, which was nice too for the physical stress. Uh, but I feel very lucky for the amount of, uh, that our emotional well-being was, was looked after. Um, Obviously, you weren't forced to take part on, in that, but you were encouraged. Um, and yeah, which was very uh, grateful for. Great, thank you. Um, what sort of things could libraries do to prepare themselves for responding to this sort of emergency crisis? Kate or Carla, you're welcome to jump in. I've got other <laughs> members of my team here too. <laughs> they might have a better answer than me. And also I, was, I saw Paula was here too. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say that. Oh, hi everyone, that's Kate. Um, I was just gonna say Paula's here too and she was actually a response manager for this disaster. So, uh, you know, maybe she wants to jump in. Um, I'm, I'm not sure there's a whole lot you can do because every incident is different, but uh, I think our council has put in a lot of time and effort into making sure that um, a lot of staff across the organisation are now uh, trained up in at least the basic um, SIMS structure and um, what to do in the very basic um, sense of a response. Um, and yeah, I think that's probably all you can do uh, to, to prepare because you just never know what it's going to look like. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question is, um, it's, it's marked as an operational question. Uh, did you work in shifts and were there proper debriefs to the team replacing? So to begin with, the um, initial team was working 12 hour shifts. So like Kate was there, for 12 hours. Um, I was not there for 12 hours and I was there for uh, kind of my normal working hours because I had to do daycare pickup. Um, but they had handovers for each shift. Um, and so when I started, I would get information about what I was doing for that shift and what I needed to know. But they had complete handovers from welfare manager to welfare manager who was then going to um, debriefs with the other managers so that you knew what other wings of the sim structure was was doing. So there was a really good handover, um, but within that we had staff that could not work a full 12 hour shift. 12 hours is a long time. Yeah, especially when you're doing the nighttime one. Yeah. Wow. Um, will the Umahu School Library be a public school partnership and open to community too? Carla or Sarah, you're probably the best to answer this. So at the moment, um, with the Amahu School, once the school library is reset up, hopefully it will be open to the Amahu community. Um, initially, before the cyclone, we were having conversations with them uh, because they were really keen on having their school library open to the community. So we were helping with that um, process. So yeah, if all goes to plan, 
the school library will be open to the community at some times, but we don't know what that looks like yet. Also, I mentioned Sarah a few times, but I never actually said that Sarah is from Services to Schools. Welcome, Sarah. You can unmute yourself at any point if you'd like to add any um, comments to any of these questions. Um, the next question is, were any of the library staff who were helping also impacted personally by the floods and how was that managed? Yes, um, we had staff who were based in Napier, so couldn't get to Hastings. Uh, we had a staff member who lived uh, further out than Pukitapu and she had another bridge go and so she couldn't get to town for a very long time. I think eventually uh, a family member left a car on this side of the bridge for her and a few times she used that river crossing and then there was a walking bridge. Um, so while she wasn't at IMT boots on the ground for that, she was our key um, member in that community. And so, so um, IMT used her to get information around um, dropping, you know, helicopter supplies in. Um, and she became so key to that having someone in that community that we could communicate with. Um, we had a staff member in Omahu who lost their house. Um, and I know that council wide, there were quite a few staff members who, who had severe damage or completely lost their house. Um, Carla made a comment um, to me yesterday about someone who was trying to make it over to do um, their shift and had to be rescued off the top of a car because they were so um, they so wanted to get here to do to help. Um, in, I mean, I I don't know the ins and the outs of the help that was offered, but we would not put someone in a position where they were having to work if they didn't feel like they could. Mm -hmm. um, during this event, I wasn't in my current position. Um, and obviously all the, the psychological help that we had available as well. But there were many, many staff members who were severely impacted. Um, I was very lucky. Thank you. Um, what sort of support would you like to have seen other library organisations or the library associations give you? Um, I don't know if I have anything to request. Does, does Kate or Carla or Paula, you might have been in a better position during it to have anything to add or request? Uh, no, I saw that pop up on the questions and I, I can't really speak to it myself. Um, I wasn't in this position at that time, um, but I know from other things that have happened since Gabrielle, um, you know, just checking in and, um, you know, sending their love and, and good wishes um, would have definitely happened during that time. Um, other than that, I don't know if there's a whole heap that other organisations can do. Um, yeah. Sure, thank you. Um, how difficult was getting communication out when the power, internet and phone lines went down? I know Very you've spoken difficult. a little bit about that. My house has never been so busy as the day when we had no communications. Um, I had Kate pop over to see me, uh, my sister walked over, uh, my brother who's also here sent a family friend from the other side of town because all of a sudden our whole family had stopped replying. Um, but it was really, really hard. You couldn't get texts through or you didn't know if they had made it through. There was um, no internet. Um, and, and when it did come back, it didn't come back for everyone. So you actually didn't know who was receiving communications. Um, 
And then in Napier, there were generators that were then stolen. So that made it even harder. So people would have communications for a small time. Um, I think it made it really obvious how much we rely on that technology and that communication. Mm. Um, a staff member who has since moved on to a different organisation said that she was listening in on a um, on a sit on a um, like a fake situation where there was training, and she said, "But you're not going to be able to communicate. Like I've been through this." And everything you're doing right now relies on people being able to receive a text message and it won't happen. Um, yeah, so very, very difficult. You have to rely on your neighbours. Um, one of the questions that's just recently risen up, um, how important was the relationship with the local iwi to the response of Cyclone Gabriel? I feel like someone who was in a higher position during this would have a, a better understanding for this. Um, there is an iwi Māori representation wing on Sims, but I wasn't involved in any of these discussions, and so someone else might be able to speak more to this. Hey, uh, Casey again, I'll jump in. Um, again, I'm, I was in a very similar position to Kristen and can't really answer this, but uh, a, a big thing was that we were, um, a lot of my eyes stood up as community hubs and evacuation places. Um, and there were definitely people that were working um, to communicate uh, with iwi and hapu in the area, um, but it wasn't part of, of our our sort of space. Um, we did have a library staff member, um, in fact we had a couple of them that were visiting Marais who, you know, who were Māori um, and were able to um, build those relationships as well. Um, but yeah, we weren't super in that space. Okay. Maybe a couple more minutes for questions. Is that okay, Alexis? They're, they're still coming in. We might have to get them to um, Kristen separately and give you written responses. <laughs> but anyway, let me carry yeah, on Kilda, for now. I think, yeah, just, just one last one for Kristen. Oh, oh. Kia ora, Jane. Okay, the one at the top. Were there any things the library didn't have that you wished you could have had at the time? Uh, for me, laptops. So at the moment, we're going through a process of rolling out laptops to library staff, but um, we did not have laptops at the time. So my first day in IMT, the first two hours, it was waiting to get the technology that I needed to be able to do the job. Um, but I can't... I can't think of, of anything other than, than that off the top of my head. Um, I think it, it brought home just how close we are as a family. Um, us all working together during this and checking in and seeing how everyone was. But yeah, not having the right tools to do the job made it very hard. And I guess even if you had had laptops, one of the other questions is asking, um, do you think library should have emergency generators and a Starlink set up? Because I guess if the internet's gone down, then maybe, you know, your laptop's not going to work anyway um, without that perhaps satellite um, assistance. Yeah, I mean, our the Hastings Library is just across the road from the council building. So we were mm -hmm. doing all of this out of the council building. Right. Um, and we didn't actually have staff on site at the libraries during, during that time. Um, I'm sure the community would have loved it, but we didn't have the staff to to be open in, in allowing that. <laughs> um, so by the I mean by the time I came on board, power was back up. I don't know what it was like in those very early early hours um, because I wasn't there myself. Thanks, 
Thank you. Um, we've got three minutes to go. Is there time for one more or would you like to wrap up, Alexis? Uh, I think I, I can blend this question. This, the question that is at the top is actually mine, which I've snuck oh. in there and put in there um, <laughs> as anonymous, <laughs> um, which was uh, which which I think would wrap up quite well, because I think, Kristen, what you've done beautifully is really taken us through the journey of of how librarians responded in the immediate aftermath, but also and then in the weeks and months that followed. And one thing um, that I was really um, touched by was seeing how your libraries have been involved in helping the community to come together and um, to reflect on their experiences through commemoration. So just want, wondered if you had any comments to share about, um, like you've touched on the Recollect site and that role of librarians and kind of memory making and um, that documentary heritage kind of storage. But I really loved the um, the boards that you had up in libraries for people to share their experiences and kind of come together. So I wondered if you wanted to talk to those and that initiative and how well it was received by the community. Yeah, so those um, commemoration boards were actually a, um, a council-led initiative mm. and it was to commemorate the first anniversary of the cyclone. So the idea was that they would have these boards um, in various places in the community where people could come and they could write messages and then they would be um, unveiled at the... Uh, anniversary and then they would be shown in, in various areas of town. Um, it didn't quite work the way that they expected. Um, I think time-wise and also people still weren't feeling that great. Mm. Um, so we had boards in the Havelock Library and Hastings Library um, for people to write on and then afterwards we had them on display for about a month. Uh, we did make it quite clear that um, the council would have to manage the boards and we thought that a risk was that people might not be that positive on them mm -hmm. because, you know, people were upset with council. Um, mm -hmm. And we did get some lovely messages um, wishing other people strength and reflecting on lost family members and pets and um, the experience of community. Uh, but I just don't think it quite turned out how it was envisioned. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but an initiative and a, and, a, and a creating of space for the community, I think is well-intentioned, you know, shows that ongoing commitment of council and of your your colleagues in, in, in libraries to create space for the community to come together. And, and um, yeah, it's re really, really great what you guys have done there. Um, so yeah, I just really wanted to thank you on behalf of our committee, our Standing Committee on Climate Action, um, not just for coming here today and presenting, but your uh, being engaging with Jane and I to plan the session. It's just been an absolute pleasure and really special to, to meet you and to learn more about your experience. And um, thank you so much for sharing everything with everyone today. Um, thanks everyone for coming and um, anybody who's watching this later online. Uh, from the Climate Action Committee, just wanted to say that we are planning future webinars, so please come along when you see them advertised. Um, also share your climate related initiatives and any news on Leanza Connect. We've got what, the wonderful Sarah Jordan on the call from our committee who goes and shares climate news really regularly on there. Um, so please interact with her posts and share your own. And do get in touch with the committee if you'd like to um, to have a chat with us, anything that's been raised in today's session, like Kristen has shared um, beautiful stories on behalf of her um, organisation and 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 what, what they've gone through there, but there's many other stories to tell. So um, please get in touch with us if you'd like to work with us. It's climate at leanza.org.nz. So yeah, thank you again, everyone for coming and a special, special mihi to Kristen, aroha hanui. Um, thank you and I'll pass back to Angie. Kia ora. Thank you, everybody. Kristen, that was amazing. Thank you for um, you and your team. And thank you, Alexis and Jane and um, Climate Action. I'll just close with a karakia now. Inuia, Inuia, Inuia ki te uru tapa nui. Ki a wātia, ki a māma, te nākau, te tīnana, te wairua e te āra tangata. Koia rā e rongo, whakairia aki ki runga. Kia tina, tina, hui e, tai ki e. Thank you. Thank, thanks everybody for coming along today and thank you again. Kia ora, ka kite. Ka kite, ka kite bye now.